Okay. Oh, that was different. All right. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. It's uh, right on at two o'clock. Uh, first thing, just want to acknowledge that today's meeting is being held on the traditional territory of the Saanich people. Um, question about, uh, next thing is the agenda. Item three is, uh, I know it's a short agenda, but could we have a motion to approve it? So moved. Second. Okay, and then uh, the last meeting minutes were circulated with this. Um, any questions about the minutes or are we good with, with, good with them? I'll move adoption of the minutes. Second. Any issues with the minutes? Everyone happy? Okay, approved then. Brings us quickly to item five, which is I guess the principal reason we're having a meeting today. Um, the presentation and, and Mike, you are there. I don't know if we really need introductions or do we, or should we just kick it off to you? I'm good to kick it off. I think, um, I think I've uh, met everybody. I think this is the same crew uh, that was on my presentation some months ago uh, yes. with respect to an introduction to the pontoon. So yeah, I'm, I'm good to go here. I yeah, I think you've met us all, at least virtually. That's about the only way these days, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sir. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so let's hand it off to you, Mike. Great, thanks very much. I'm just going to share my screen here. Does everybody see that? Oh, there we go. I'm going to start from the beginning. Um, so I'll preface my presentation by saying that, um, once again, it's, it's a bit of a beast. Um, I'm going to go through a lot of material here. Some of it, I know everybody's received the MOU, draft MOU, um, and I'm going to work through that draft MOU and add some more context around um, how we would view the project, uh, decision, makings, decision making around it. And um, I guess more context and how to view some of the intangible values that I think are going to become a primary um, factor in, in analyzing the project. Uh, so with that, oh, and, and I'd just like to mention at this point, I'm certainly um, you know, hopeful we'll have some question and answers, have some dialogue. But if everybody could hold those until the end of the presentation, because you know, I, I would hope that uh, a lot of those questions will be answered through it. And I'm happy to, um, as I mentioned, uh, get into some discussion uh, at the end of the presentation. So with that, um, I'll begin. So Beacon Wharf replacement proposal. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of a, a, a kind of a, a recounting and an overview of the downtown waterfront area that's in and around the pier building. And um, some of you may be quite familiar with, uh, with what, what I'm about to present and others it may be quite insightful. Um, so I'll start with uh, the present the unique and successful partnership with the town of Sydney. Certainly, you know, I started um, working with Grant Rogers in 2002 and we acquired um, uh, an acre on the waterfront, which was essentially, if you look at my pointer here, kind of in and around this area, um, it was not inclusive of the shops at Port Sydney, but it was the kind of the majority of the site where the Pier Hotel is right now. Um, and we started working on um, our working towards how are we going to approach uh, uh, the redevelopment of the site and worked with the town, uh, with staff and council on, on a variety of different proposals over the years. Um, but I'll just work through and show you some before and the afters of, of what took place. Uh, so Sydney Pier Hotel and Spa was obviously the, the, the focal point. Um, in, inside the Sydney Pier Hotel and Spa is the Shaw Ocean Discovery Center, which was uh, part and parcel of a negotiation with the town. Um, Beacon Park revitalization and expansion. The extension of the waterfront walkway. Landmark building renovations. Uh, we, I'm actually sitting in the landmark building right now, and um, we actually did you know, fairly extensive renovations on the ground floor of the landmark building. Uh, shops at Port Sydney renovations. Uh, related entity um, to the pontoon company is the, the leaseholder of the shops at Port Sydney. Uh, Sydney. Sydney Seaside Sculpture Walk, that was something Grant Rogers actually kind of initiated and, and brought to the fore. 
uh, Seaport West redevelopment, uh, another development on Seaport uh, Place on the west side of Seaport Place. Uh, and what we see as the, the last remaining piece is the Beacon Wharf redevelopment. Here is a shot, believe it or not, this is a shot of uh, the site where the Pier Hotel is uh, right now. This is circa around 2002, right, when we bought it. Um, I know it looks like a bit of a moonscape, uh, and that's in fact what it looked like. It was a gravel parking lot. Um, it was green plywood fencing that surrounded the gravel, gravel parking lot. Uh, this was Beacon Park. Um, there was a bandstand that was in the center of Beacon Park. Um, it was um, it was something that had a lot of sentimental value, frankly, and uh, something that was quite an interesting kind of project onto its own. And this was the former Marine Mammal Museum. Um, one thing I haven't put an arrow to, but if you look across the street here, where the the cannery building here, this is where the old Sydney Hotel used to be, the tavern. And it's Paquette's property, and it was actually a, uh, it was demolished, and it was a gravel parking lot at the time. And I think you can see uh, this is Dennis's father's RV that he used to park on the waterfront there, um, Roland's RV. And this was a, this was the waterfront. Here's some on the ground photos of it. Uh, actually, Mike, if I could just comment. Absolutely. Uh, in your previous slide, when you pointed to the Marine Mammal Museum, that a part that you're actually pointing to is the, the old, old customs house that got annex, located yeah, yeah as part of your project too yeah and I'll, I'll i'll talk to that in a little bit but yeah this interestingly for those who may not know the off of beacon wharf used to be an access point and peter you know better than i but it was this was actually a, they, they called it the customs building and there used to be two buildings here and used to drive through the center of the two buildings to clear customs so the brick building that is now at the top of Beacon Avenue, that is the uh, the Tourist Information Center, that was this building right here, the building that, with the arrow to it. And then there was a cinder block building that was kind of the annex to it. It was an addition to it. And um, I distinctly recall walking in the front door uh, and there was a, it was called the Marine Mammal Museum. And there was a fellow uh, volunteer that was reading a novel at the front and he had a coffee can there and you put in your donation and you went in and the exhibits were like flipping light switches and light bulbs would go on and that sort of thing. So it was something that was quite outdated. Um, there was also a, a, um, another facility. It was the, um, a, a floating facility that was in the marina, um, which had some laboratories and it was kind of an educational um, facility. Um, there's a great old uh, bio biologist. They used to, marine biologists used to hang out there and they used to be, have the, the kids come through and go through their classes. And uh, that was the, um, was it called Ian Peter? The Bill Austin and the Marine Ecology Center. Marine Ecology Center. So used when we, up in Couch and Bay. Then it got towed down to Port Sydney. And uh, and then when we put the, port, the pier building together, um, Kind of part of the trading and negotiation was the, these. We knew the marine mammals was gonna, the museum was gonna disappear. The ecology station was sinking, frankly. So that kind of got mothballed, and it was combined into what we know as the um, the uh, the new uh, Salish Sea Aquarium that's in the in the uh, in the pier building now. So moving on, there's here is where the, this is the backside of of the old uh, area that we were talking about. Here's the uh, the bandstand, and this is where the pier building is right now. Green Mammal Museum bandstand. Uh, you can see there's a gravel pathway here. The uh, the town actually didn't own the gravel walkway or the walkway at that point in time. Uh, uh, we did <laughs> at that at that period of time. Um, you can see that it was really a, a weed covered gravel parking lot. Victoria Distillers is in the building that you see now. So here's a bit of a before and after shot. Um, I've tried to scale it as best as I could. Um, you can see that Dennis Paquette developed the cannery building, which I think was a great addition to the waterfront. Um, we developed the, uh, the pier building. I just uh, tried to scale out what the existing grain space was prior to and, uh, and overlay that. And you can see the the tremendous expansion in terms of green space that resulted um, from the development and the work that we did with the pier. 
uh, with the pier and, and with the town. When we were doing the excavation of the pier building, there's actually a bunch of rock uh, that came out and there was a decision that was made to um, utilize that rock and actually expand. Uh, you can see the difference here in terms of the, the Beacon Park area. So there was, it was expanded by about 14, 15,000 square feet as a result of that project. And you can see what Beacon Park looks like today. Waterfront, Beacon Park. Uh, of course, Sydney Pier Hotel and Spa became the anchor of the waterfront. Um, community gathering place, we quite like to call it Sydney's, uh, Sydney's living room. Lots of people treat it like that and then we're happy to have them. Uh, this is the old annex to the, uh, to the, um, the old customs house. And this is where the Marine Mammal Museum was. This is what we have today, which is really a world-class educational attraction. This is what it used to look like along the uh, landmark building. Uh, you can see it was ribbed concrete. Um, we actually took a long-term lease on the space and with the landlord. And you can see that we actually replaced the ribbed concrete with storefront. Um, and we have a lease on this space till today. Uh, of course, Victoria Distillers has become a real feature and a success story on the waterfront. Um, you know, for quite a while, frankly, it was a it was a vacant building, and uh, Grant Rogers and another partner bought Victoria Distillers and brought it to the waterfront. And again, Peter helped and council at the time in terms of making sure the zoning worked to get it in there. And I think that's been a real great improvement for the waterfront. Um, she sells Sculpture Walk, as I mentioned. Grant Rogers uh, was a large part of that initiative. Uh, this is the where the Seaport West building is now. This is the before, just just be a, simply a parking lot. This is what it looks like today. So now, what are we left with? We believe that the remaining opportunity to to complete the waterfront is Beacon Wharf replacement. Uh, that brings us to the our our P three proposal, and I presented it in a draft MOU. And the reason that I did that is because you know we virtually all of the projects we have worked with in the past, or the large majority of them, have been in partnerships and. And it often starts with an MOU of this nature. So I thought it was the best way to, to kind of put down and get documented um, what would make for an initial MOU and something that would preclude an, an actual agreement. Um, and in that, there's a bunch of background. And what you'll find, and I'm sure you've gathered through reading the MOU and in my presentation, is that um, market development, Sydney Waterfront Partnership, the pontoon company are very related in, in and around the waterfront. And I don't think that a project really works um, to any great extent with any commercial um, enterprise for sure with the Beacon Wharf replacement without the involvement of, of the various holdings that our group has down there and in particular related to the parking and the synergies that can be derived from it. And so that's why I provided you with the background so you can just get some understanding. So Seagate, as you know, is the owner of the end floating concrete pontoon. Um, Sydney Waterfront Partnership, we'll call it SWP from now on, owns 100% of Seagate. SWP also owns 100% of the Pier Hotel. Mark Developments, who is Grant Rogers, it's Grant Rogers Company, is a 50% partner in SWP. And Marker owns surplus parking stalls located under the Pier, pier Building. And uh, as stated in the MOU, to be clear, those are surplus, they aren't. Um, required under the parking boat loading bylaw for any specific purpose at this point in time. Um, to give you an idea, we call this the ground lease. This is the shops at Port, Tid, shops at Port Sydney um, leasehold land with the town of Sydney. Um, Rum Runner building, again, Victoria Distillers building, 9158, uh, which is the Surly Mermaid uh, building. Um, are all part of that ground lease. It expires, the initial term expires 2038, and then there are two eight-year renewals on top of that, which um, lead it out to 2054. Uh, another note is Port Sydney Marina. The town actually owns a portion of the bottom of Port Sydney Marina, and that's included in this ground lease. So Port Sydney Marina is actually a subtenant, a uh, sub-subtenant of, of Sydney Waterfront Partnership. Um, Administratively, it goes directly through the town, but they are in fact a sub sub -tent. So again, for, for the sake of this presentation, these purposes, we'll call Seagate, SWP, and Marker all collectively as, as city waterfront SWP group. 
the objective to redevelop uh, Beacon Wharf property into a P3 project to manage, maximize the total combined amenity and economic value of the property. At the end of the day, we want to make Beacon Wharf a great place and a public space. Um, in, in planning for and in looking at what the potential is of the space, um, we always take inspiration of other exceptional waterfront locations. When I um, uh, was working with Grant at the very beginning and, and a marker group uh, when we purchased the waterfront property. Grant actually sent me to San Francisco and I went, I drove from San Francisco to San Diego and I stopped in at every small town, every waterfront town along the way. And the idea was to gain inspiration and insight as to what made a great little, great small town, a great waterfront. Um, the thing that I noted, it was really connection with the waterfront, I think is what really defined those communities. Um, Monterey has, uh, you know, probably on a bigger scale, but a lot of what Sydney has, it has um, great marina space. It has an aquarium that's world renowned. Um, it has dining on the waterfront, but it, the, what really defines that waterfront is connection with the water. This is, a, um, this is an interesting project that um, Jen and I became familiar with because we were talking with a company called Seaflex and they actually do mooring systems um, for large structures like con concrete floating structures. They, they provide kind of the bungee cord, um, the bungee cord anchor lines. And they did a project in Tasmania, believe it or not, um, that's called Brook Street Pier. It's a floating pontoon building in the waterfront area in the city, called, in the city of Hobart, Tasmania. And we thought this was quite an interesting, um, in, uh, an interesting inspiration in terms of what could be, what's possible in terms of waterfront building. It is a large concrete floating pontoon. Um, it was constructed in 2014, 2015. It cost 14 mil, or 13 million Aussie dollars at the time. Um, and it has some of the, you know, 5,300 tons and largest floating building upon completion in Australia. You can see that it is, it's the architecture of it is very light. It's something that has a nautical feel to it, um, but it's really a floating building. What we're talking about is a floating building and ancillary space that provides great public access down to the water. But at the same time, it's something that we really looked at. And, and as the architect described it as a, a tourism and transportation hub, um, we could see this as a real hub. Our, the, the, the project we're talking about right now, Beacon Wharf replacement, is a real hub for the downtown waterfront. So I just want to put some disclaimers. This was with great help with Jen's team, and um, they've, they've done a great job in terms of taking some of the, our, our information relative to the pontoons and some of the information you see from Hobart there and put together some um, some of which you guys have may seen or components of it. But this is the, um, just to give you a plan view perspective of scale and location. Um, this is the layout of the pontoon at, at the present. And you can see obviously uh, Beacon Park and the Pier Hotel uh, to the west. Um, here's an overview. Uh, as again, you see the, the building is inspired. Um, by the, the structure in Hobart. Um, of course, we have a 266 foot long floating concrete pontoon, 103 feet wide. Um, I know that in the SNC Lavalin report, they talked about wave walls as wave protection. And it's something that we're not too crazy about in that I think it'll create a separation um, from the water and something that isn't um, aesthetically great. And so the concept that we've come up with is instead of creating a wave wall along the perimeter of the pontoon, we actually create a platform that's in the void of the pontoon as we see it right now. And that platform would be five feet high. So if we have five feet of freeboard off the water with the pontoon and five feet high of this raised platform, um, our thoughts are that will provide the building with the, the wave protection that would be required. Um, we also would add uh, certain wave shields if that were necessary you know there will be an element of design that we'll have to consider in terms of the final design of the building and, and the wave protection but our thoughts are this is a far better um, formula for creating a good platform for the building and then providing ramps down to the lower levels that would provide access um, to that really on on top of the water floating feeling 
Uh, the Beacon Wharf building, 91 feet wide, uh, pardon me, long, 55 feet wide. Our concept is to have eight hotel rooms uh, on the top floor and have a 120 seat restaurant on the main floor, um, 60 square feet of commercial retail unit and 400 feet that the town of Sydney would, uh, would own. Um, the idea is that the, to derive economic value on the waterfront, uh, the hotel rooms uh, is, um, is something that we really believe that we could incorporate into the existing pure hotel operation. We have enough capacity and overhead room to take care of something like this and it become a feature of the hotel. Um, and the 120 seat restaurant would be something that would we would look for an operator for and, uh, and uh, somebody to lease the space from us. Um, you know, there's some options out there that are that are really good options, I think, that, that would be interested in such space. Public square, the, the landing area of the ramp would be a, a public square. Um, we would have protected moorage uh, on the inside portion of the pontoon and then the outside portion, we'd look at seasonal moorage along the 266 feet. There would be pedestrian ramps that come down off of the platform and off of the building onto the 266 foot long um, lower portion of the pontoon. Again, there's 266 feet long, they're 23 feet wide and that would be on each side. So that gives you a good overview of the actual, um, the proposal in terms of the building and the pontoon itself. I know that um, there's been a lot of dialogue and discussion with respect to um, massing and view corridors and how that would impact the waterfront. And Jen's team was, uh, did a great job, I think, in terms of putting together some images here that really help in that regard. So this is a view for the viewpoint from Glass Beach. Uh, to be noted, this is the high tide, highest tide scenario. And as you can see with the ghosting that's uh, inserted here, it's roughly the same height as the current fish market building. Um, looking straight down Beacon Avenue at the roundabout. Um, again, we have a ghosting in of the current uh, fish building and, and the current cafe. You can see that because uh, you can see a plan B on the right here, because the, the pontoon would be set further out in the water, uh, it really minimizes the impact uh, from, on the view quarters from shore. And it fits in really well relative to the remainder of the, of the frontage of the, of the walkway. This is the viewpoint from Beacon Park. You can see there would actually be less of an impact on that southeast view from the shore from Beacon Park. So that gives you a real good feel, I think, for the massing and, and the view corridors uh, impact of the, pro of, the, of the perspective project. Parking requirements, always a big question on any new development. Uh, of course, when you introduce an 20 seat restaurant, uh, parking load on, loading bar will tell you that you need 24 additional parking stalls. Um, you need two parking stalls relative to the additional CRU space. Need hotel rooms uh, would command six additional stalls. For the source of these parking stalls in uh, the shops at Port Sydney, we actually have enough capacity that in stalls that are not required uh, to be designated under the parking loading bylaw that are currently pay parking that we could designate as parking for um, for the new Beacon Wharf. Uh, I mentioned that Marker has parking stalls underneath the, underneath the pier building. Um, those would become, uh, those would meet the requirement uh, for the parking stalls under the parking loading ball off for the hotel edition. So the contributions, SWP group would contribute the end pontoon, 100% uh, of the Beacon Wharf building costs, cost related to the new pontoon deck underneath the Beacon Wharf building. Proportionate share of the electrical water sewer drain services cost and building permit costs. Uh, annual crown lease fees that uh, when the water lot is finalized, we know there's gonna be crown license fees that are, that are uh, gonna result from a commercial enterprise on the water and that would get passed through by the town. Of course, we'd be paying annual property taxes. And I, I think a, a real contribution is that of course, it would be for a fee at 5% that we would be the project managers for the project. Town of Sydney contributions. So all the project costs not covered by the SWP group, including the removal of the existing wharf structure, 
pontoon towing, refurbishment and moorage, abutment and ramp, renewal and amendment of the water lot lease, uh, leases, if necessary leases, proportionate share of the building permit costs. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it's 2054 is the, um, if we execute the options that we have, uh, the ground lease would expire in 2054. In order to get a 50 year time horizon, which I think everybody needs to justify the project, including ourselves, we would look for two additional 10 year ground lease renewal options at market. Um, it'll be, as we know, a year or two um, before we're able to start construction on the project. Um, that's primarily due to obviously the approvals process, but also the, the, um, the, the renewal and expansion of the water lot lease. Benefits for the town of Sydney. Yes, of course, a solution for the wharf problem. Uh, primary reason that the subcommittee has been um, constituted. Uh, almost a million dollars in value for contribute SWP group. That is the value of the pontoon and the um, space in the pier building or the wharf building that we're describing. Expanded tax base due to the commercial operation. Uh, we really believe we bring a lot to the table in terms of managing co-space projects. Uh, ensuring there's continued investment in the shops through the additional 10 year ground lease renewals. Uh, an example is our our um, our sublease with the Rum Runner building is going to be due in just over a year, year and a half now. Um, you know that building is going to require some significant investment. People want to, are going to want to see something of significance happen um, in that location and, and in general with the shops at Port Sydney. But given the um, the minimal time left in the term of this of the ground lease, it's something that um, is really a negative relative to investment decisions that Sydney Waterfront Partnership will make for the ground lease lands. Uh, a bonus for the town or a, or a benefit for the town is that we're open to severing the portion of the land lease that relates to the section of the Port Sydney Marina that the town has ownership over. So it'll just provide more flexibility and, and there is, I know, ongoing discussions with Port City Marina as to um, you know, their, their relationship with the town. And this will give them some value in that regard. Uh, one thing that's interesting, the Hobart project that um, I uh, pointed to in Tasmania has a, uh, a geothermal system that runs uh, off the bottom of the pontoons. And that's something we could certainly do. So it would be a, a very, uh, very cool green infrastructure project. Um, some of you may know that in the pier building, we have one of the probably the more successful um, open loop uh, geothermal systems probably on the island. And so we have a good knowledge base on how to, how to work a geothermal system and how do you design one. And uh, that's something that we could, that would definitely be a part of the design for the building. More town of Sydney benefits a new regional class destination and a focal point creating vibrancy along a key waterfront area. Unique connection to the waterfront via the creation of numerous new public amenities and facilities, including uh, the gathering space uh, for the, the public plaza. Water level access was again, as when you're floating five feet on, on top of the water, I think is a really interesting feature and something that will really help connect people to the waterfront. Uh, there will be more, as we mentioned, um, both protected and seasonal. Washrooms, I know there's a need for washrooms uh, down on the waterfront. Free parking as related to the uses uh, for the project. An access point to the downtown from the water, another access point. So it's SWP's investment decision, you know, obviously the town and SWP have to look at this and determine um, how, how would you value this as an investment. Um, for us, we put together a pro, forma invest, a pro forma investment analysis, and we look at our capital investment. We have a $795,000 pontoon, and that's the market value of the pontoon that we'd be contributing. Obviously, there'll be significant cost for the development of the new building. Um, parking spaces will have to be acquired from the pier, and then uh, from the shops at Port Sydney will have to be rededicated. In return, there'll be eight additional hotel rooms added to the existing pier operation and a 4,000 square foot restaurant with triple net rent that we'll get off of that property. 
and 600 feet of CRU triple net rent off of that property. It all adds up, you know, and I know that um, in a prior meeting that uh, the 3P subgroup um, reported back that it is a really a marginal rate of return for this project for us. Um, as you can imagine, it's a significant capital investment to build a building and do all the things that we're describing and, and eight hotel rooms and a rent, the rent of the restaurant create a return, but it's not, it's not a significant return. So why would we do this? Intangible benefits. We do believe there are, are some really um, materials, tang intangible benefits to SWP. Um, the 50 year lease will allow us to provide additional investment and an investment uh, urgency into the shops at Port City. Um, more quality and higher leasehold improvements. Consolidation of the parking with specific uses rather than pay parking for general use. And just an overall synergy for all of the holdings that we'd have in the area. You know, one plus one equals three, a more attractive and valuable area for everybody. Um, so a go or don't go decision, you know, the financial return for both parties is minimal. I think that's safe to say that the financial return obviously for the town is minimal um, and there's shared investment risk there. The key factors are really intangible returns. So how is a goal decision justified when the returns are intangible? You know, how do you make that decision? So to put some context around this, um, I've, I've, um, I've created the, a, a presentation on really how uh, a number of uh, smart decisions that the town has made in the past have created great intangible returns. And this kind of place making, place making concept, it's a bit of a buzzword in, in kind of the planning world, but it's, I think it's something that has some relevance here. So it's really um, the process that creates great public spaces. Like how do you, and, and Sydney has a number of them, how do you come up and create great public spaces? Well, great public spaces are valued, often valued on intangible benefits for the community. And they are all, they're also made as a result of synergies with private businesses. Oftentimes, great public spaces have the energy and vitality of the public of the private spaces that are around them. So what I've done is I've gone through and um, and put together a presentation of some of the great spaces in Sydney and some of the history behind those. So Port Sydney Marine and Shops of Port Sydney, we've already touched on that a little bit. Beacon Avenue is a really interesting study. The Pier Hotel and Beacon Park, again, that's all related to Port Sydney and that. The Lockside Linear Park and the Lockside um, Improvements. The new skate park, which is a favorite of mine, even though I'm not a skater, but that, uh, I think it's been a really great project. Here we are, another trip down memory lane. Um, so the Beacon Avenue revitalization. I know Peter could probably tell us a lot of stories about this one. Um, I wasn't here then. I actually started, I've been, I, mean, I think I'm in my 19th going on 20th year in Sydney. Um, so this was a bit before my time, um, but this is what Beacon Avenue used to look like. And, and I, get, I would gather this picture would have been probably mid nineties. As you can see, you have uh, um, power poles that look like they're ready to fall over, power lines, um, narrow walkways, two way street. Um, and as we know, that's not the Beacon Avenue of today. So there was a revitalization project which undergrounded um, the power lines, took the power poles down, widened out the streets, beautified the streets. And um, I know that I've heard one story that at the time Mayor Amos was the mayor and he said there was such a, a hue and cry from the business owners there that he was scared to walk down Main Street for a couple months because he would get his air bent. Of course, we know what Beacon Avenue looks like today. And, um, you know, it's one of the great kind of small town main streets, uh, probably on the island or even in British Columbia. And hopefully you will see things like the, seas, the scenes that we see in the lower right here soon, but it's, it's created a great amazing vitality for the town. So I think that's a real success story. And it, did, it, it came with a lot of opposition and political will to, to get it through the process. Port Sydney and shops at Port Sydney. This is this is a bit of a data picture, but this is where uh, Port Sydney Arena is located now today, and this is uh, some of the infill site where the shops at Port Sydney is located. So um, again, I'm going to hate to do this to you again, Councilor Wainwright, but I recall that one of the meetings when I think it was when actually when the pier building was um, 
was approved that you recounted the opposition that there was to Port Sydney Marina, and it was a real battle. And there was a lot of, um, especially from the waterfront homeowners behind there, I think that everybody agreed today that Port Sydney Marina has been a really great addition and the shops of Port Sydney to the waterfront and has created a great connection to the waterfront. Beacon Park, you can see that this shot is actually, it must have been in the mid 80s because of the, uh, the landmark building is actually here. So again, this is what the waterfront looked like not that long ago. Um, and Beacon Park and the pier, and this is a bit of a um, talking again about our project, but um, you know, there was um, certainly a great partnership that took place between the town and both in terms of developing Port Sydney Marina and the shops at Port Sydney and our project. And they worked with private interests and, and created some great public spaces as a result of that. Um, again, you can see the great, op the great options and, you know, in terms of, uh, I think it's just the wonderful scenes that are created there for the Sunday concerts and all those things wouldn't be possible without some of the partnerships that took place. Rockside Road, again, Rockside Road, um, this is another one that, um, this was 2000, mid 2000s, I believe, 2004, something to that effect. And it was a bit of a struggle again. Um, it was underground of the power lines and then the linear park beautification. And this is what we have today. Uh, again, this is one of my favorites, the old skate park. Um, I think these pictures speak for themselves. And this is what you have today. And I can say that I drive home every day I go to work, I drive right past the skate park and it is absolutely buzzing. And it's not only buzzing with um, you know, younger or older, it's, it's a mixture of generations from brand new skaters and, and uh, parents all the way to guys that have been doing it since they've been in their teens that are now 30 or 40. So value and intangibles, what are the common characteristics of what I just showed to you in terms of the great kind of the great features of Sydney? There's a lot of change that's involved and with change comes controversy and opposition. Costly, there's no doubt um, those projects were costly and there had to be um, you know, a lot of analysis and understanding of what those costs meant. Um, they received staff and political support and initiative to see them through. There had to be you know, some real strong inertia behind these projects in order for them to see, see the light of day and become the great at attributes they've been. I think the biggest um, characteristic they share, they've been, they've been successful and they've, created all, all of them are great places and public spaces that help define Sydney. And I don't know if there's been a swing and a miss, frankly, in terms of, of what, um, since I've been here in the last 19 years, um, relative to these sorts of projects. So the goals of SWP and, and my presentation today present a high value. I know I don't like the word once in a lifetime, but really our, the um, infrastructure that we have is really unique and it, it really is something that once it's gone, it's gone. Once a lifetime opportunity to, be, uh, to the Beacon Wharf Replacement Subcommittee, illustrate the value of a, a P3 project, a win-win. Um, we're hoping to receive commitment and buy-in from um, Beacon Wharf Replacement Subcommittee. And we're hoping that the subcommittee resolves that it sees merit uh, in the SWP proposal, in our proposal, and recommends that council include the SWG P3 proposal as a key option for the Beacon Wharf replacement uh, public consultation. That's my presentation. I'm open to questions and answers. And I, in fact, I think I have some questions as well. So, Thank you very much, Mike. Um, yeah, have a, you have questions yourself, Mike, or do you want to start? Oh, you guys far away and now maybe I'll follow up. But yeah. Okay, uh, questions from everybody else. So maybe I'll start things off if I can, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I've seen the presentation previously. One of one of the components, and, and I thank you, uh, Mike, because uh, you added um, the segment at the end, you know, looking to the synergies and comparing this project to some of the other successful uh, developments in in Sydney public developments, and uh, and you've articulated very well um, the SWP markers' role in. Um, the waterfront bringing it to what it is today um, and those have been as you noted based on um, partnerships of, of uh, cooperation and trust and, and very successful so thanks for for the presentation 
Um, one of the elements, uh, if you just circle back to it uh, and speak a little more about uh, Morage and what you see for potential in terms of Morage, uh, I think the presentation, you know, depicts the, the public use space very well. Maybe if you go back to that, one of the overheads uh, about midway through the presentation might help. Um, it speaks very well to the, the, the diagram speaks very well to the public space that would be uh, available. Um, the, the moorage space uh, in the center that you're describing um, perhaps as uh, year round, if I understood correctly, and then seasonal uh, along the sides of the, uh, uh, the floating uh, pontoons. Um, what do you see with that height differential taking place? What sort of investment be required to actually facilitate seasonal moorage there, Mike? Yeah, I, I, frankly, we haven't uh, haven't explored this probably as much as we could in terms of and and as um, as private businessmen or a group, we're not as interested in kind of the management of the moorage. Um, it's something that we would look at. You know, there's a marina that's next door that may be interested in, or the town may have somebody that would be interested in it, as kind of one-off um, management of that moorage space. That's not something that we see as is that's really um, um, valuable or, or something that will work with us necessarily because we aren't in that business really. Um, so we'd be open to dialogue with the town in terms of what the correct approach is for that. Um, in terms of the seasonal moorage, um, I know there's concepts of putting in seasonal floats. Um, there's questions around that. Is that gonna be cost effective to do it that way? Or can we simply cantilever off some some um, seasonal floats, some permanent areas that would would take the um, the deck level down? You know, it looks like we're going to probably have about five feet of freeboard, freeboard above um, with the existing pontoon. So there would be some requirement to obviously get ramps down to right onto the water and have have some some float level kind of either cantilevered or temporary facilities there. But in terms of the economics of that. Um, and kind of the real technical elements of that, we haven't dove into that as much as we could. So it remains to be determined if uh, if moorage in those areas is is going to be cost effective or, or necessarily feasible. Yeah, I think it would be for certainly for for the right the right party. I'm certainly there'd be interest in doing that. It's I just guess we're saying that that's not something that we're particularly interested in doing. But I think that I think there would be an opportunity there for sure. And you know, there's opportunities. There's always um, this whole pocket cruise industry, and hopefully that becomes a thing again. And Sydney would be a perfect location for pocket cruisers to come in, which are smaller kind of cruise ships that come in and take advantage of right off of the you know right off the wharf. You would have downtown Sydney, and, and you have all the benefit of that. And I know they're looking for locales to pop into. So yeah, I think there's definitely opportunity there. It's just that I think it's just more exploration in terms of who the right operator or partner is for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter, go ahead. <clears throat> Mike, I'm wondering if you uh, gave any thought to uh, uh, potentially use using the roof. And, uh, you know, it, it seems like uh, well, a great opportunity for an observation platform, for example. Um, but it also looks like it, you're certainly going to be seeing it from above, but it, it seems like it, it's kind of a, a wasted opportunity to not take any advantage of that additional kind of level, even if it's just solar panels. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely you know a great a great suggestion. And frankly, we haven't taken a strong look at the roof. And part of that might be because, and I guess we could have some feedback back and forth or dialogue back and forth with the town. Would there be opposition to that from you know some people? <laughs> would they would it be deemed to be something that's too much? But um, absolutely, I think the roof could be um, something that would be could be a great opportunity. It could either be commercialized a bit, maybe it becomes a rooftop deck for the for the uh, for the restaurant somehow, or or like you say, maybe there's opportunities in terms of solar panels or additional um, observation space, because it would be tremendous space. There's no question it would be really unique up there. So no, I appreciate that. And that's something we'd certainly explore. Actually, while I think of it, um, something else you might uh, think about as a feature would be um, uh, mounting some underwater cameras and uh, you know having some 
subsea viewing uh, as uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, something it'll become it'll become out. a community underneath there for sure it'll become yeah that's another great show yeah absolutely might be you know is there something that we could send into the um to the aquarium as well from that perspective yeah. some feed so we're going to jump in and just say exactly that, Mike. That if there was, if there were underwater cameras, it would be a perfect feed over to the Shaw Center, wouldn't right? it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a, a quick question about the building. Um, the SNC Lavalin work that was done for us, basically all of the all the renderings there showed just one level. Um, in terms of being able to go higher, especially the the concept of the roof deck as well. Is there is that been is that something that we've got as a to do if we want to push forward with this to be able to handle two stories? Yeah, I have, you know, there's it's an interesting world, and this is no disrespect to SNC Lavalin, but there's there's different specialties in the engineering world, and um, the contacts that I've talked to, and and one thing you'll say is buildings are light. At the end of the day, there's not when you think of a building and what's involved in a building, there's not a lot of weight that comes from a building. Mm -hmm. Um, so it doesn't create a tre tremendous amount of loading. Um, you have to remember that there was a fully loaded, this thing was, this pontoon was originally designed to take the load of a fully loaded interstate highway on top of it. Right. Um, so, you know, it, every, all the indications that I have are that the decking and the, and the kind of the decking that we could put on, this would be more akin to something that you'd see in a um, parking structure or a bridge. That's what, how we deck the, uh, the inner portion and it's not extremely heavy as well. So there's ways that we can do this that, um, yeah, my preliminary investigation is that the, the, the weight and the loads that they would, that the building would create would be handled, would easily handled by the, uh, by the pontoon. Okay, thanks. And that's, that's obviously, the deck. The, that's, Sorry, obviously that's further investigation after that. But, uh, yeah. Right, so at the moment in terms of, um, because I agree with you, buildings are generally pretty light when you think about their overall footprint, right? But the space they occupy, but there's a lot of air inside. Exactly. The um, SNC report also did tell us about adding flotation, especially towards where the ramp, beside the ramp to shore. Um, if that is also re finalizing those types of things, is that under, who? who's that under, under the way the MOU works, the way you've structured it right now, to actually carry through with finalizing what's needed and getting that done? Is that the town? No, the town, it, it would be a combination in terms of the decking itself, because the decking would be the responsibility for the building and in and around the building would be SWPs. Okay. Um, I, again, I have, I have contacts in precast concrete company and an, an engineering firm that specializes in these kind of unique projects. And so we'd look towards them, but I think it, in, there would be an equitable kind of sharing of that between the town and ourselves. Okay. And then one last quick question for me, and then I want to, I, I'm looking for hands up, but also um, the orientation that you showed it, I think it was on this slide or the previous one from shore, and the, then the views from shore and, and um, Seaglass Park, that it looks like, I just wanted to verify, that's the exact same distance out from shore to allow for the dredging and so on that SNC showed us, right? You basically put it in the same spot. Yeah, I, frankly, this was, this was created by Town of Sydney staff. And I'm assuming that they they use that information. Jen may be able to speak to that, but I'm assuming that it, it looks like that's the case, but I can't speak to that for certain. I mean, it looks like it, and I see a thumbs up from Jen. It looks like it because then the like the view from shore from sea glass and from beacon is based on the building being a certain distance out and with the length Correct. of the ramp. So yeah, I got a thumbs up from Jen that is following what we already saw. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, and there will be some discussion, you know. Um in terms of what their right orientation is for the pontoon relative to the um, the wave activity, that is, yeah, yeah. There's going to be a level of of engineer and design that's going to that's going to be required in order to find out what the right thing is relative to the aspect of it coming in and and reflective waves and all that sort of thing. But this is what we're working with at the present with the best information that we have. So. Yeah, because there's that dominant southeast storm factor when it Correct. comes to the orientation, right? Yeah and having the thing rock a little bit, especially up on the roof deck. <laughs> well, I think you'd be surprised though, you know, you'd have some movement there, but um, the, the mortgage systems would, you know, it, it, they're, um, yeah, I could send you some videos yeah. of, of what these things look like when storms are hammering away at them. And mm. yeah, they, they'll, they can stay pretty steady for sure. Yeah. Okay, um, anybody else, who else? Scott here, I'll go if uh, I have a slot. Please go ahead, Scott. Mike, thanks for an excellent presentation. Uh, 
just as good as your last one. Um, thank you. Um, now, a couple of questions, just in terms of project management. Um, I, I think there, there is, uh, we have a report from the city staff uh, highlighting that it's an advantage, I think, to have a project manager who's invested in the project. So that all sounds good. Um, just in terms of phasing, we've identified as a overall committee, a number of things that need to be done to better secure the engineering design, uh, wave modeling or improve wave modeling and some observations, a geotechnical study, um, an evaluation of the concrete structure itself with some cores and, you know, uh, assessment of of its status just before advancing would would how would you see that happening as would the we sort of reach agreement establish an mou move and then the the project manager takes over those those aspects um sort of those outstanding things that need to be done to firm up the engineering side yeah, i think that there's kind of two components there one was would be kind of a um a due diligence component that the town of sydney would for example core sampling of the of the pontoon and just getting final, um, whatever the recommended approach is to, to get final sign off as to the kind of the, the um, physical condition and, and expected life of the pontoon would be something I think that the town of Sydney would, would look at before they would commit themselves to purchasing the pontoon. I think once the town of Sydney is, is satisfied with, with all of that, um, then I think it would be a phase where it would go into, I think that the the relationships that we have, um, and a lot of them are on the Fraser River, frankly, in terms of the the um, the, the engineer and, and, and people that do the construction of these marine type of, of projects would be, it'd be really worthwhile to get us involved in that and in the design and get the right people looking at this to do a final design of the project as it relates to, as you mentioned, the, the um, there's going to be an environmental aspect. I'm not quite sure how that would shake out. Peter could speak to that in greater detail, but in, in terms of the actual location and moorage of the pontoon, um, and then the work that's going on inside the pontoon and in and around the pontoon, there'd have to be a spec that would be looked at. Um, so that's something I think the engineers that we work with and our team would be really, really um, kind of beneficial and kind of being involved in that. So I'd, take, I'd say that would be more of a, a partnership with the town and ourselves. That, that sounds uh, sensible. Um, thank you for that. And just uh, one other question. Um, the elevated uh, five foot rise beneath the structure itself and the, um, the side wings, which are at a lower elevation. So I, I guess you're, visual, you're envisaging, you're achieving an all weather uh, operational capacity for the restaurant and the hotel. Uh, but the lower level remains sort of seasonal access if there's a storm or whatever. Um, yeah, and I think that's and one of the reasons that we like this design is, I could bring this up, is when um, when you wanted to create the seasonal um, kind of um, access, you'd just, you'd block the ramps off that provide access down there. And, um, you know, when you get those big winter southeasters in there, it's just, there's just no access down there. Um, we would also look at the potential of putting some sort of protection around the building, you know, just depending on how the wind wave analysis ultimately um, shows itself relative to where the water is going to get on the structure. But our, our view is that you could create for the building some additional protection on the sides of the building as well um, against the waves if, if there is a risk that they're going to come up over top of even, you're going to be about 10 feet above the water at the, at the ground level of the restaurant. At that point, so will you need some supplemental protection from waves? Is something we'd really investigate as well. But yeah, it, in terms of the the lower portions of the pontoons, there would be certainly periods of time where you wouldn't have public access down there. Thank you. And then my final question is the ramp itself um, coming into the public square area. Uh, we've had some discussions in the committee. You know, should there be vehicle access? Um, and I think you may have mentioned two ramps. Or um, I'm just wondering. You probably haven't really thought that part of it through. And I think the responsibility is more on the city side, as as you've outlined. Um, but do you have any initial thoughts on the ramp, or is that something that you just would prefer to just separate? Uh, yeah, I think that you know, there's going to be. The, I think the primary purpose for the ramp, I believe, is going to be um, fire safety. You know, in terms of getting getting what what's required from the fire department down there to for that purpose, 
And I th obviously secondarily, there's going to be deliveries and, and access for the restaurant and for the hotel. But I think, I think it would probably be sized relative to fire safety. Thank you. Uh, if everybody's quiet just for a moment, Mike, I just have one, one thought based on everything. Everything seems to be very tied to a 50 year horizon. Like that's basically going to make this whole thing work for you and, and a lot of aspects to the town. The pontoon itself, um, one of the questions that keeps coming up, which is why the core sampling analysis and so on of the pontoon, is to also see if it has a 50 year life in it as far as the town's concerned. You, I assume you're just as interested in knowing the outcome of that analysis as the town. So um, what I'm thinking is what are the key um, milestones that lead to a no a go no go overall like for instance if something showed the life of the pontoon was substantially less than 50 years that's probably a showstopper for you just as much as it would be probably for the town itself yeah i think um our familiarity like this this pontoon was built to army corps of engineer standards it's when when and i'm not exaggerating when 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 workers go in there and try to work on it the concrete's so hard that they break their tools um, we've had purchasers, you know, as I've described in my prior presentation, that have done all kinds of due diligence on the pontoons and invested substantial sums in them. Um, and so I don't know if we have an exact time horizon for its, its life, but I think 50 years is something that we're really comfortable with, that, it, that it'll be at least 50 years. That's something that we're, you know, based on our experience with it and based on what we've seen from other purchasers. And for example, the, the um, it was small craft harbors that bought the one that went to Port Alberni and they had, um, they flew up a guy up from California that was, took, took the core samples and then he was a floating um, structure specialist and they, they, did, they did in depth, um, um, in depth research and, and study into uh, investigation and study into what they, ex that they believe the usable life is. I'm not quite sure where they ended up with that, but it's, we're very comfortable that you'll get 50 years out of it from our perspective. We don't have any, of our, of, um, well, originally we had uh, actually Hay Haying Company do a report on that, but I, yeah, I'd have to dust that off. But in terms of 50 years, that's something we're willing to believe is going to be be there at the end of the day. So, mm -hmm. okay. And then uh, one last um, technical question, maybe is just going back to that ramp coming from shore, going onto something that's now a little five feet higher than I guess what SNC showed. And maybe it's also maybe just as much a question to Jen as, as to yourself is, is the ramp at a high tide, does the ramp end up slightly going uphill in the end, or is it pretty much level, Jen, or I don't this know where is the, this is the image, uh, This is the image at high tide. Um, so this gives you an idea from Jen's team's perspective. Okay. Because I know one of the details that the committee is working on is just how the tie-in at shore is finalized and all the things about accommodating sea level rise, et cetera, et cetera. So just, that's a detail that we'll just, we'll just get back to, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a different thing to ask about. And um, I, I guess, uh, Mike, I'm wondering if you've um, considered at all what kind of benefits may be there in this project for the Wasanich. And the reason I say that is, um, there's certainly going to be consultation as part of the uh, um, the expansion of the, the water lot or water lease. And I know that um, the Wasanich Leadership Council is kind of um, moving to the view that uh, major projects in their territory should provide some kind of benefit for the nation. So I, I'm sort of you know, are there any opportunities and, and it would be things like um, their war canoe tours maybe basing out of here or perhaps um, Wasanich um, arts and crafts being sold. But um, it may be a benefit to the project to get an expedited um, uh, response to the, the water lot uh, lease expansion to uh, you know, have something in it for them, or or at least think about that. Yeah, no, frankly, we haven't we haven't explored that because we're 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 trying to get it just to first base here, I think. But um, 
but I think that's something absolutely we'd we'd we would I think we'd take the expect the town to take the lead on that. You know, but we'd certainly be um, open to and be involved in the conversations in terms of what might be available in that perspective. Um, yeah, I think we're the our first. We're hoping to get you know as you'll we're hoping to get some sort of um, as I mentioned at the end some sort of backing from this group to start and through council and, and get it going that perspective. But I, I get where you're coming from there for sure. Too. Uh, Rob, if I could, a question um, through to staff. Um, I know in the in the, one of the schematics, uh, Mike, you'd identified um, a square footage area uh, for, for town use uh, internal. Uh, you had 600 square feet, I think it was, of- 400 space. for town of city. Yeah, 600 for uh, commercial um, and, and 400 for town. Through to staff, is, is this something that uh, uh, you see as utility space to support the uh, operation of, of a facility like this? Is it public washrooms? Is there some sort of potential amenity there that, that staff would find that space to be of value? I suppose that's for Jen. I might actually turn that over to uh, either Randy or Andrew who have I can worked a lot more on this proposal. I think our initial inclination was, and I mean, this is more this is where more discussion, I think, um, obviously, um, makes, needs to take place. And I think um, that, um, you know, there might be um, additional options. I know uh, early indications, you know, uh, noted uh, the, the possibility of public washrooms, etc. Now we're, we're looking at uh, additional public washrooms. Um, um, uh, closer to the shops in Port Sydney, but um, Certainly, we've heard that the demand for uh, for washrooms uh, are are there within the within the downtown. So, um, again, this is where some initial thoughts uh, um, were brought to the fore on that. But uh, I think uh, I think you know we need to uh, we need to think a little bit about what other potential opportunities might exist. And uh, and uh, and again, maybe those options are put forward as part of the. Uh, the community engagement process and uh, we hear from the community and uh, and ultimately um, what council's thoughts are regarding uh, regarding that additional area. Okay, thank you. I might add um, the report states that the increase in public square footage along the two sides of the building is uh, 750 square meters. So in addition to the town space within the building itself, you're talking about a fairly substantial net gain in um, public space closer to the water. Hmm. Okay, um, Sarah, you had your hand up. You have, I'm just sort of thinking about order of people here, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of that was just discussed right now, which was my, my question was really talking about what was envisioned for that, that public square. So that's kind of being covered, but I guess where I would have tied into that additionally was, uh, um, for Peter's question about the Wasainich and earlier when I had been at a, at a, a, a food conference, they had been talking about the Wasainich uh, fishermen and I think another local fisherman group had been talking about, they, they were interested, you know, in our fish market and, um, and in, in seaside, you know, sales of their products, which, you know, boomed during the pandemic. So we'll see what happens now, but some of that demand probably won't go away. Um, and so I was just wondering if they're, you know, as part of that kind of public square and public market or, you know, public space, whether that might be something um, that might be a benefit to them and, and the Wasainich Nation. And that would tie a bit into moorage as well if they were bringing in commercial boats. But if that was something that, uh, that would be within that, you know, scope of the public consultation and, and the Wasainich consultation, that would maybe be another um, commercial venture as well. Jen, did you want to comment on? Sorry, I just wanted to clarify that that 50 by 55 public square will be required for vehicle turnaround radius. So that won't be able to be any, you know, permanent um, additional amenity in that even even the, the furniture that um, uh, Jesse kind of added in there that might not even be possible if, if the public square is that small. So um, could maybe be temporary, very movable um, structures, but that's about it for that space. 
Yeah, because I'm not surprised to say that, Jen, thinking about like emergency vehicle turnaround space and all that in front of the doors there at the, at the front of the building, that has to be allowed for permanently. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Um, Allison, you had your hand up. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Mike, for highlighting all the placemaking work that has happened in Sydney over the years from a planning perspective, that's a real benefit to the community to see those public improvements and help with that sense of community and creating places for people to come together and to be together in their community. So this would be a real addition to that, creating that additional public space that Andrew mentioned along the sides and just a different type of public space for Sydney. I think it would be a real benefit. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to just echo that as well. I'm looking at the drawing, th imagining things like the on that lower level. And my personal reaction is I like the lower level. It's separate from the upper level. Multiple levels always, I think, just helps define the spaces better. Um, I can imagine like the future fireworks performances, the yacht races and all kinds of things, where as, as long as that can handle the crowd, um, you know, how wonderful some of that some of that stuff could be in terms of like future amenities, uh, just uses of the space. Agreed. Uh, Andrew, and then Andrew, and then Randy. A quick suggestion moving forward. Maybe when we take this to the next stage, we um, don't refer to that upper portion as a public square and focus instead on the two sides of the structure. Mm -hmm. That really is more indicative of the uh, uh, the way it's going to work. Sounds good. That sounds good. Yeah, Randy. Yeah, and just to emphasize the size of those, um, the two sides at 266 feet long by, I think Mike indicated 23 feet or 25 feet wide. Those are significant space uh, areas in terms of um, additional uh, sort of public public realm. And uh, yeah, just to um, echo on to uh, onto Allison's comments about uh, um, you know the value of placemaking. Um, again from a planning perspective um and i think mike on you know he, he brought this up in his presentation but uh the um the value of great spaces and what contributes to great spaces is is obviously the public realm component um you need that public realm component uh where members of the public can gather but a key element to that is the is the is the private element that is adjacent um, and and, I, and, it, and for me, it reinforces the um, the whole perspective of, um, in order, in my mind, uh, for something like this to be successful, um, a standalone wharf without a building to me is just um, just an area. <laughs> it's just an open area, and uh, without uh, without the the value added associated with um, uh, a, um, a private commercial offering. Um, I think, uh, I think um, it's, it's not really, the, the value isn't there. So um, I think with the, with the commercial component, I think that's what is ultimately going to make uh, this uh, a, a truly potentially special place. Um, anybody else? I have some questions if I, if everybody else. Oh, of course, yeah, Mike, go ahead. Sure. So what do I, you know, again, a, a, a P3 is a partnership and um, and as I highlighted in 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 my presentation that it, it involves projects that are involved change and, and opposition and, you know, certain amount of controversy are gonna have, are gonna need backing. And so I was open to ask, um, Councilor Rintoul, what his thoughts are relative to how the, you know, in a public in a public consultation and public feedback realm, what is going to make or break, um, I guess, his perspective on the project? Is it a percentage of of people that come in support or against, or what are the factors that you weigh up? Because we know there's going to be people that are going to be opposition to the project. Um, you know, it's it's it has a it's going to have a fairly high price tag, um, and and there's going to be involvement from the community, and we know that that's going to be part and parcel of the um, of the process. So, 
So I was just wondering from Councilor Rintoul's perspective, what what is what are the factors that he weighs up in, in looking at a project like this? Yeah, thanks. Can I let Councilor Duncan go first? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, it's a it's a good question, uh, Mike. Around you know where the uh, where the political will is to to see something like this move forward. And and you know what we've committed to is is to to put forward options uh, for the community and for consultation. And so uh, yeah, we're elected to listen and, and get that feedback. Uh, to me, the threshold on this is going to going to come down to uh, you know what a borrowing scenario could look like, and uh, and an approval process on 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 that basis potentially. And so uh, I know we need to do some more work on the numbers to be you know comfortable. Uh, with uh, putting that element forward for, for public uh, feedback. In terms of vibrancy and in terms of a vision for the, the, the waterfront and the connectivity that this offers, uh, to me, this is the most exciting proposal. Uh, you know, I, I see it as uh, something that um, completes uh, our, our waterfront. Uh, I see it as something that fits really well and certainly, uh, you know, comfortable uh, speaking in favor of seeing it move forward to council for for feedback, uh, but again, in terms of the, the dollars and cents, uh, Mike, you know, I think uh, there's probably when the when the subcommittee resumes its conversation around the staff report, that's the next item on the agenda. You know, that may be a component where we want to have some some discussion and and try and get a better handle on uh, how much information. Uh, around that, how finite it needs to be uh, as we look to advance this, you know, in particular beyond council and for public consultation. Um, so Councillor Duncan, I do have a question for you as well, because I did have a, uh, I noted in a, in a prior video, a, a recording of a meeting that um, you had mentioned that you didn't necessarily need to have, a, I think you called it a dock in order to have connection to the waterfront. And I'm just wondering if you could, you know, I, as I mentioned, when I've seen great um, small towns and, and small town waterfronts, there is this inter interaction and there is uh, either with a wharf uh, that's on piles. And of course, we do have the fishing wharf. Um, but what is what is um, I, what are your comments in, in, in that regard relative to seeing something like this board? Do you see amenity value in this or is there something that you could kind of expand on? Um, the importance, I guess, of a project like this. Yeah, so what I meant by that was, for for my perspective, where I go in Sydney <laughs> to interact, you know, with the ocean and the seafront is the beach, like actually the beach, the, the natural features are what's important to me. So, so for me, more additional really engineered constructed space is at a really, really big price tag is, I mean, big, big to me as a millennial, <laughs> it, right? Uh, and so that, that's something that's difficult for me. It, it will be, I think, very divided um, in my generation. I know older generations, this is it. This is the future and the Jetsons and the whole works. But for my generation, it's like, half of them are going to say what we actually wanted was a Costco <laughs> and more housing <laughs> that we could live in. And they're just going to be like, why are we building more floating hotels and more stuff for rich people to park their yachts in? And the other half are going to say, well, we've been gr we've grown up with like the specter of climate change and you and your children are all going to die by fire tomorrow. As, as the thing. And so looking at it as like a, a 50 year plan to have a floating structure and the risks inherent in that and the of, of kind of like, what are we committing to for the future when, you know, the restoration and actual, you know, natural contact with the world is, is something that's important. So uh, yeah, I don't know, it, it can, I think like it is definitely, it is a good proposal and in terms of what I think the overall general public will like is this this would this would be more favorable um, but yeah I, how to bring in more of a an actual public element um, you know 
more luxury hotel rooms and and the and you know the public square is is based around that again is is difficult um, and and again more very wealthy people sell boats <laughs> rather than than beach space which is free and children can actually can actually run on that is difficult for me um, how difficult it would be on balance I don't know but appreciate the answer. Yeah. Um, Councillor Wainwright, I have a question for you in relation, you know, you, you, I've been here for 19 years, as I mentioned, you've been on, on most of the councils uh, during my tenure here, and, and I think you've been a part of, or all or most of, of the um, projects that I've kind of highlighted in my presentation. And what were the factors in those, because uh, as, as I mentioned, um, and you know better than I do, there was a lot of controversy around those projects, and, and, and there was significant cost, and and you know there were certainly some that were based on amenity value in large part. So, can you comment on what was what were the factors in in in, in a generalized sense? Obviously, there's a number of them there, but um, that would that brought you on side on those projects. Um, so, I think a key thing is uh, just a good process in terms of uh, engagement with the community. So, you know. Like if I think about the Pier Hotel, um, significant open house, um, and there was a, a, a survey of uh, of the resident support, and uh, that was done in a, you know, a, a, by a, a, a qualified uh, consulting firm doing a statistically valid sort of survey. So a good opportunity to engage where all the information is out there is a key thing. Then um, you expect to hear a lot of loud opposition, even if it's a relatively small overall percentage. So uh, loud opposition really isn't a factor uh, affecting my thinking. But um, I, I do separate where I'm in a project like this, I'd be interested in what the downtown business community is thinking about it separately from what the community at large because if the majority of the downtown has got some issues with it um, that will affect my thinking and uh, beyond that um, if if for whatever reason i believe that a strong majority of the community is is of one view or the other that does affect my thinking but I'm expecting it's going to be split, um, that there'll probably be apparently equal support and equal opposition on this. And at the end of the day, then, I'm probably going to be evaluating it on, um, on the merits as I see them after listening to people. So that there's no sort of magic threshold that you've got to cross other than it's got to be a good process. Gotcha. I appreciate that. That's uh, that's good input. Uh, one, one anecdote there is, and you'll probably remember who he was, but there's one individual who was stood up in one of our public meetings for the Pure Hotel and it was yelling at us across the crowd and, and saying all kinds of things and he ended up buying one of our condos <laughs> in the building. And so, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic at times, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember Don Amos going to uh, the mayor's breakfast meeting after the, um, uh, the, you know, the Beacon Avenue one way, uh, wearing a um, RCMP flak vest and <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Right, those are my questions. Thanks, thanks for your replies, I appreciate them for sure. Yeah, Scott here, could I just insert a comment? Scott, go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, hear, um, I, he I hear this, this, this comment about the, the public value and the beach versus the, the yachting, uh, you know, those kinds of contrasts. The one thing that strikes me uh, for consideration is um, the use of the word public square uh, is a great, you know, concept in my mind. And I, I think we've agreed that 
the public square where it presently is uh, situated is actually going to be a kind of a business access uh, vantage point rather than a kind of an open area uh, where we might have some art or or you know mill milling about it really leaves me wondering this this is this this competition for space the um we could cover the uh, present uh, protected moorage area to provide a real public square on that that area so you know at the present time this is envisaging this protected moorage which in my mind isn't really protected in, in under any circumstances but it could be planked over or covered over and provide a much bigger public square um, for which maybe it's the town's responsibility or us as a committee to offer up some of those very inventive ideas of what that public square concept, whether it's underwater cameras or uh, uh, First Nations art displays or whatever, um, what that area might offer. Um, and so I think that, you know, for our committee, I'd like to see us talk about um, that sort of concept that Sarah was putting forward. How do you you make it truly a community and, and certainly, um, you know, we have some experience from other examples that we might explore. And I, I assume, Mike, you'd be open to talking about that. It sounds like the moorage side of things is not a big hook from your point of view. Um, so it's kind of an evaluation of merits of, of potential access to moorage versus other usage. Would you, does that sound reasonable? Oh, I'd, I'd agree with that. And, you know, I think it is a pretty unique kind of opportunity to use the notch in, in you know, the open space there. But I agree with you that if, if it's deemed, I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of public space on the lower pontoons, whether mm -hmm. that's, you know, four seasons is another question. Um, but there will be a, a like an immense amount of public space down there yeah. that I think will truly be special and that families will be able to enjoy and, and really appreciate, you know, similar to other, other, um, public areas that you see along the water side. I think it, it will provide a unique um, kind of access point and interaction with the ocean. But uh, again, I do hear that um, if there's more value put on a, like you're saying a public square that provides that space in, in the open area and whether it's at the level of the, of the raised area and more protected from the water or if it's at a lower level, that would be up for debate. The other factor would be just how much load and how much flotation does the pontoon have to add that decking over that space, because that's right. certainly part of the equation. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the answer for that. So those would be two of the factors involved. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. The one thing about putting a public square or space out where that protected moorage is, that will have a lot more exposure to the sea breezes. Mm -hmm. So that really sounds like a summertime public space. But summertime, you've got all of the lower pontoon area without you know worrying about wave issues and stuff so i i don't know i i i can see uses of the protected moorage like uh sydney spit ferry or uh you know war canoe tours or stuff like that not so much luxury yacht moorage but i i do see opportunities one of the things i'm starting to think about as well is um there are things you can do to kind of strengthen the connection to uh, to the rest of the waterfront, like the sculpture walk could uh, could extend down here. Yeah. And and in fact, um, the sort of wind animated sculptures could really be impressive <laughs> in this kind of setting. Agreed. And I think we could create more of a connection around maybe open moorage here where you come around and create more of a walk, like a, a walk where you do walk in and around and come up again and, and have a feeling that it is an extension of the waterfront walkway. Um, where you could do a little little loop down on the pontoon and then come back up and continue on your walk. Yeah, just to jump in, I'm a, two, two examples that keep coming to my mind of something like that on a huge, on a much bigger scale, something like, uh, oh, downtown Vancouver with the, uh, where the cruise ship terminal is and the public, the public ability to walk around that completely separately from going inside and uh, obviously going to where the cruise ships go. Um, Bellingham, Washington's um, Alaska ferry terminal, if you're familiar with that, again, 
Um, there's this, there's the large building that's not floating, obviously, but it's the large building, which is primarily there for the uh, for the Alaska ferry access. But it's but the, but there's a lot of public aspect to it that they made sure was there, and it's a it's a part of what that town offers. So there's good examples where the where the integration of a walkway, uh, basically, like you say, in continuation of the seawall, the art display, and that type of thing, if it's done right, it, it makes it flow. Yeah. Any other questions or discussion at this point or um, otherwise, I guess, oh, sorry, Andrew, one more, at least. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Mike, uh, sorry to blindside you with this. It's just the more I think about this, I, I have to worry a little bit about the insurance aspect. How do you see that working with respect to the town's uh, potential liability to tenants? Um, specifically in what, in terms of the flotation of the building, is that what yeah, you're inquiring about? Business or? interruption kind of a idea. Yeah. You know, I, I honestly have not really delved into that at all. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's certainly a lot of examples of waterfront locations that have that sort of risk. So, um, you know, we could certainly talk to our insurance broker and I'm sure he'd be able to explore that for us. Um, but I don't really have a, a good answer for you right now. Okay, just putting it out there for uh, potential future negotiations. So, Mr. Chair, maybe uh, I just uh, maybe look to staff. Uh, would we like a motion to receive the uh, presentation? I know we've got uh, more to proceed here with the staff report and uh, a recommendation there. Um, but in, in the interest of, of time here, uh, about a half an hour left, did you uh, want to see a motion, uh, I guess, through to, to Randy or Jen to receive this for information at this point? I, I think it would be, I know we have a separate uh, recommendation associated with the staff report, uh, Councilor Rintoul, but I think a uh, yeah, motion to receive the presentation just so we have it uh, documented that uh, I think that would be that would be helpful. Thank you. So I'll move receipt of the presentation for information. Second. Everyone is happy then, uh, so be it. And then yeah, in the interest of time, unless there's anything else, maybe we should move on to, um, to the staff report, which is item six on the agenda. Yeah, and I guess uh, we can thank Mike for his time as well. Uh, I'm sure you're, you're welcome to sit in if you want, Mike, or watch it later. But uh, <laughs> thanks very much for uh, the presentation. I thought it was excellent. Yeah, thanks to everybody. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks thanks for your, uh, your answers to my questions. I, I do appreciate those as well. And thanks for the time. Yeah, greatly appreciate it, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. So if we move on then to item number six, uh, some um was it randy or or um or andrew one of you two i think is going to introduce the actual report did, did you want to speak to speak to the sort of the financial elements andrew and i, I know we sort of summarized or i summarized this um, sort of elements of this for the um for the committee at the last meeting but uh Maybe just some of the financial components, if you don't mind speaking to, and I can uh, I can jump in on some elements as well, if uh, if that's helpful. Sure. So the bottom line here is, while we were hoping for a greater financial contribution towards the town costs, that hope wasn't really based on reality, more of just pure hope. So that for me. Um, the fact that we get, let's say a 20% contribution to the town's overall cost of doing this, uh, I think is valuable. But what to me is the bigger uh, contribution is them project managing this uh, for us and having a vested interest doing that is really invaluable. Is, if, if the town were to take this on and look for a project manager, which we would have to do, you're always uh, rolling the dice with whoever you get and how invested they are in the outcome of the project beyond you know, just getting their final payment. So to me, in addition to the 20% uh, contribution financially, there's that additional 
intangible in terms of what they can bring and bringing the town's overall cost down. So I've, I've made some projections here for what um, the total cost might be, and that's based on the SNC numbers. SWP thinks they can bring it in on the lower end. So the annual servicing costs um, that the town would be left with for, for our portion of the borrowing for this project would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 234,000 on the low end to close to 400,000 on the high end. And I think it would be closer to the low or somewhere in between. And part of that would be offset by the um, tax revenues associated with this operation. But ultimately, if we want something out there, floating option with a, a P3, in my opinion, is the only realistic way to go. And ultimately, it's going to come down to whether the public sees enough public benefit in the town's um, long-term investment in this to make it a go. Yeah, if I can maybe just um, just jump in and just um, just quickly um, add to um, Andrew's uh, Andrew's comment. Um, I guess one of the things that I struggled with when we were thinking about um, the P3 option um, was sort of reconciling the whole uh, perspective of what is a, a public-private partnership. What what does a P3 look like, and uh, what you know? I guess what's the what's the value of a municipality entering into into a P3? Um, and I know it's noted in the report that. You know that um, you know we had an initial sort of goal in mind of 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 you know the level of contribution that uh, would be uh, provided by um, um, SWP, and um, you know it was in the sort of the higher forty to fifty percent sort of range of overall project costs. But when you reflect on that, and 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 again, looking at um, the numbers that um, they kindly uh, provided to us, you know, it's 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 clear. And Mike again made it clear in his presentation that uh, that um, you know the um, the level of profit um, that they're seeing is marginal. And uh, but what's making this proceed is the intangible benefits. And uh, so. Reflecting on that and reflecting on, I guess, what I see now is a, is a P3, it's really about uh, shared responsibilities, shared costs, uh, and shared risks. And um, there's no way we're going to be able to, to, um, to try to undertake a project like this and, uh, and not have a, a, a true apportionment of costs that, uh, that need, to, uh, need to be taken on by the uh, the municipality and ultimately, uh, ultimately the taxpayer. Uh, but uh, there is that level of, of, of value added that Andrew pointed out in terms of project management, and uh, and there is a level of contribution that's being uh, being provided as well. But they're taking risk on, um, and um, likewise, if uh, we want to uh, move forward with a with a project uh, like this there is going to be a level of risk as well on our on our end. Sorry, go ahead, Andrew, you're muted right now. If I can just add one thing I haven't worked into the numbers is um, the positive impacts around extending the the, um, the seaport lease, um, mm. the, the ground lease uh, on the um, on the site where the, the distillery is. So they, they would renegotiate that to begin at um, today's market rents, which would have a slightly positive impact for us, but also the additional investment they would undertake there would certainly add to not just the, the vibrancy for, uh, for the community as well as for their own benefit, but it, it would lead to additional tax revenues for us. But at this time, it's not factored in just one of those intangibles that uh, will apply to both parties. Yeah, he did mention, didn't he, that um, one of the leases, I guess like the Rum Runner was coming up soon and that that was a building that was something that they would like to see improvements made to. And that's what you're getting at, right? All of that aspect of things. 
Yeah. Yeah. So Rob, maybe I'll just uh, comment you know, further to the theme that both Randy and, and Andrew spoke to. Um, there's a lot of synergies you know, in working with, with this group. And, and uh, I think SWP and, and their interest in the immediate uh, area um, and their history of partnership with a town uh, you know, add to the credibility of the, the proposal that's here. And from the context of the recommendation that's before us, uh, we're really looking, you know, for the, uh, for the committee um, to comment on whether or not they see merit in the proposal and uh, to look to, uh, to advance this as one of the recommendation, recommended options to council uh, to put out for public consultation. And I think we'd probably be, you know, doing a disservice uh, if we didn't uh, move forward uh, with the recommendation that's here uh, in that um, certainly uh, from the perspective of myself uh, on the P3 subcommittee, uh, SWP put a lot of work into this, uh, as have town staff on this. And, and I think um, in that we're recommending to move forward with it, uh, hopefully you know, this group sees uh, merit in doing so as well. I guess I'd uh, echo uh, those comments. Um, I can't see any reason why we would not present this as a viable option. Um, it, you know, it, it clearly is. And uh, I personally, I can see it being pretty high on my um, potential list of options. I um, very much appreciate the uh, perspective of this is a, a large um, capital project that isn't a necessary thing. And, you know, given climate change and all the issues facing um, the world, uh, you have to look at this and go, should we be investing our money somewhere else? And my view on that kind of thing is, is that the community needs to find a balance. We've got to deal with those pressing issues, but we also have to um, do things that that create that kind of placemaking that makes our community uh, a quality place to live and essentially supports our economy. And some of I I fear that some of the climate adaptation that we're going to have to do in relation to sea level rise is going to be detrimental to some of the placemaking we've previously done, like. Mm -hmm. The lockside walkway may be underwater and stuff like that. So, it a, a part of me does uh, see the, the value in balancing, um, creating something new that we're we're deliberately thinking we're planning for it to survive sea level rise and and be um, place making for the future where you know and and like i say we may be compromising something else anyway i i'd be quite happy to have this go out to the community to get them to weigh in on it as an option and i i can personally i'd be leaning towards either this option or get rid of the work mm. i'm not really seeing you know a lot of merit in the options in between anyway i'll leave it at that Actually, just uh, one thing that um, Scott, you and I were talking briefly earlier today about um, that one of the things that it says here quite strongly, and I think it's the first time we've put it in writing and I have no objection to it myself, but it's just maybe worth noting that really the floating wharf is that we say is the only remaining viable option for wharf replacement. And I think we've concluded that on the basis that uh, the rubble options or even the piled options because of a building. It, there's no point in putting a building on something without a, without a partnership such as this um, rules them out. And we basically, instead of getting at it through a couple of steps, this is the first time we've basically said outright, uh, to my recollection, this really is the only thing other than getting rid of the wharf completely. I think, we, I think that's something we, I think that is something we did reach um randy or andrew see you're smiling a little bit i i just wanted to uh yeah i mean um 
I, I apologize a bit because I think we staff maybe took some some liberties there by um, incorporating that uh, that um, that element into uh, into the uh, into the staff staff report and uh, because you know um, I don't think it was ever uh, formalized um, uh, through the committee but I, I think there were I think what we heard were were some discussions around uh, around moving in uh, in that uh, in that uh, direction. So um, um, again, uh, uh, we we did take some some liberties there. So I apologize for that. But uh, but uh, again, um, even though it wasn't uh, formalized, we uh, we we thought we heard uh, heard that through some of the discussions. Thank you. Yeah, just to add a. Uh... It hasn't been officially eliminated. I look back on the minutes and uh, we decided to not formally uh, take it off the list, but the writings on the wall based on the work of the subcommittees based on the um, options matrix results. So in my mind, it's pretty much been ruled out, although we haven't uh, taken it off the table. And this is just a report to this committee. What goes forward to council the entire committee will have to uh, sign off on. So you won't have right. those uh, pesky staff members putting words. Oh. <laughs> I think actually we've got it flagged as the next meeting is the one where we were going to go through more of exactly what uh, the public consultation list looks like, which would where we can circle back on the uh, piled option, which is which I believe is still officially was there. But yeah, we'll, we'll circle back on that one next week, I guess. I, I I appreciate the staff report and uh, also you guys uh, pushing us a little bit. So this is a healthy uh, point to reach. One thing, Andrew and Randy, I'd like to ask you about is I'm not wildly comfortable with the uh, variability in, in the estimated cost from 4.3 to 7.4 is quite a range. Um, I'm just one and I, I suspect I can understand why you have that range. There's the contingency factor in the, the statements from um, Seagate that they might be able to come in under budget. But um, I just wonder, do you, do you feel comfortable with that wide range? And are there steps that we could take uh, that maybe narrow the range? And the second uh, general point I would make is I think that the phasing of how we would envisage this private partnership, private public partnership evolving, and especially when, like I tried to explore that with Mike, but you know, what parts do we advance before we move to the project management sh shifting over? I, I think that's pretty critical, especially to keep the costs down. Uh, you know, we want to be really thoughtful about how we transition through the handoff, really, to the project management side of things. So uh, I guess two questions back to you both. Uh, can we do make some progress to narrow down that wide range in the costs and do you agree this sort of project management and phasing is something that maybe we should talk through a little bit more in detail? Let me start, if you don't mind. Uh, at this point, I don't think we have the basis to narrow down the costs. I think that kind of thing would follow as we uh, go further down the road. So there is a draft MOU, which is meant to form the basis of a future agreement, but neither party wanted to take it too far until the committee and, um, and then council sees enough merit in this to uh, take it to the next stage. By the time we get out to the public, it would be nice to narrow, that, narrow it down a little bit, but I still see quite a range until we actually uh, do more of the design maybe start tendering. We certainly had a wide range on the um, community safety building project that um, we undertook over the last five, six years. And uh, we went out initially with a range of borrowing between five and 8 million. And that's a $3 million swing. And that's pretty much what we're looking at here. So I'm not entirely uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. People need to be comfortable with the top end of the range, knowing that we're gonna do our best to bring it in on the lower end, which is what ended up happening with the, the CSB. Yeah, and then I think in terms of, in terms of um, 
uh, sort of a phased approach to project management and uh, and you know how we're going to uh, transition uh, to uh, sort of the next stage and and again we're assuming that you know we get through consultation and and um, it's positive and uh, council resolves to uh, to potentially move forward. Um, I mean, again, MOUs are, are are just broad framework documents, and 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 really, the next stage is 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 where we would have to get into some real um, more a lot more detail, quite frankly, on on um, on what the structure is going to look like, um, what the uh, um, what the true apportionment of costs are going to look like for each of the parties, and um, you know, and we've we've um, We've been fortunate that we've we've worked through um, we've worked with Marker SWP through the uh, through the hotel uh, component. I mean, we had uh, I think that one involved at least um, three or four agreements, uh, and um, uh, they have a very experienced solicitor um, that uh, they work with. We have a very experienced solicitor that we work with when we're dealing with these kinds of uh, arrangements and we would uh, we would certainly want to work closely with uh, with the lawyers in uh, in crafting something that uh, fundamentally is going to be detailed enough to provide us a high comfort level moving forward because there's a lot of there's a lot of you know i's to dot and there's a lot of t's to cross uh, uh, you know if we're going to uh, uh, like i said advance this to uh, ultimately uh, construction phase Thank you. That's reassuring to hear that history and those those adv that advice. Thank you. Um, just a, I thought Jen had her hand up for a second. Oh, there. Sorry. Well, just she's, she's fine. Okay, Peter, go ahead. A thought that popped into my mind: um, we probably need to do a zoning amendment uh, to allow this. And are we going to have to do an OCP amendment too? I'll let Allison weigh maybe in on this one. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah, the property is zoned public utility here. I'm just going to pull that up and take a look. Um, hotel use isn't permitted, so that we would have to rezone in that area for that. Um, yeah, and it's the OCP designation is doesn't include the yeah the hotel use either really. Um, so, we so yeah, to, to be technically correct, we would have to change the zoning of the water lot to allow those uses to happen. Maybe we should refer this to the OCP um, process as well, because if they're talking about changing map designations in the OCP, it might be timely to include this. Yeah, given that it won't be happening for a while until the new OCP is in place, the uses won't be constructed before the OCP is adopted. There's there's time to roll these changes in. But if we undertake public consultation, like was previously discussed in terms of the timeline for this project, that's happening before the OCP is done. So there is time to include that. So Rob, I'd like to uh, move the recommendation that the Beacon War Select Committee see merit in the P3 proposal received from Sydney Water Waterfront Partnership and advance the project to council as one of the recommended options to be considered for public consultation. Is there a seconder? I'll second. Okay. Is there anyone uh, not in favor of that? All right, then I guess that is moved and uh, approved. Um, timing, uh, can I just ask a quick question regarding the timing of that? Is this, it'll go to council, is it going to be, are we going to have this go to council after we have our meeting about, uh, where we review this in a little bit more detail, but also the uh, public consultation, which is only next, a week away. I'm just not sure about the timing. If we're going to have our meeting next Wednesday and then all of this would go? Uh, Jan, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Andrew. Or Andrew. The next council meeting is um, 
on June 14th. So this couldn't get in front of council before then anyway. Uh, right. I guess it'll de depend on um, how quickly the meetings from the second can be put together. Uh, yeah. I personally don't see an issue with uh, the minutes of this meeting and the recommendation moving forward before our final report, but it's just my opinion. Okay, because I've been thinking out loud about the fact that we we requested this meeting, and, and thank you, Randy, and everyone for organizing this meeting uh, separate from next Wednesday. And I was partly on the thinking that next Wednesday we were going to try to stay on a track of getting things done in June, as I recall. So it would be great if we can aim for that. Um, we'll get an agenda out, obviously, for next week. Just was curious about the timing of this, but but thank you, Andrew. Sorry, Randy. Yeah, this um maybe I just um ask ask um the thoughts of uh Councillor Wainwright to Rintoul and, and and Duncan. Are you do you think there would be um uh value in all of council uh receiving um a similar presentation from uh, Mr. Conquist regarding his proposal? Um certainly we would look to have an accompanying staff report as part as part of it uh, from the from the committee. But um uh, yeah, I'm seeing nods on presentation. Yeah, I would think it'd be valuable, but I but I think it should be um, you know part of the overall um, recommendations that we're making to council. I don't think this should come ahead of you know the, the bulk of our recommendations. Would be my advice. So I know we've got a meeting uh, next week. I think we'll take some steps there to maybe formalize, and we've already set out a timeline as as Andrew noted to uh, come before council. But a presentation to a company uh, at that time, I think, would be very helpful. Okay. Is there anything else then that anyone? I think I don't think we had anything else on the agenda, if I'm not mistaken. In which case then, if there's anything else, otherwise we could adjourn till next Wednesday. It's only a week. I'll move adjournment. Okay then. I'll oh, uh, Chad, second that. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And again, thank you very much, uh, Jen. Please thank, uh, I guess it was Jesse who did the, the drawings. I mean, that was fantastic. It helped immensely to see all that detail. and. Randy and uh, Andrew, I guess, for putting that together and organizing the ability to have a meeting today and not sort of help us move along a little bit. This is really useful. Really appreciate it. So thanks all. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks. Bye all.